Hello, and welcome to Hack for Show Report for Doe. Um, first, let me congratulate you for coming to a talk with such a boring subject. No one likes to talk about reporting. We always want to talk about the new cool hacks, or the new cool detection methods and things like that. Um, but reporting, I think, is, uh, is a topic we need to talk about more. So pat yourself on the back from me for coming to this talk. My name is Brian King. Um, I am at BB Hacking and Discord places I hang out. I'm a pen tester with Black Hills InfoSec. I've been there for like four or five years, somewhere around there now. Um, but what's different is about me is I'm, I'm actually an artist. Uh, my, my education, my, my undergrad education is a Bachelor of Fine Arts. And I think that what I learned in being an artist and having that training is a, a little different way of seeing things. Um, I, I got my job, my first computer job was doing tech support and then I moved into QA testing and then pest, pen testing. Uh, so maybe a little bit different uh, path than some of you have taken. Uh, anyhow, I thought I would share some stuff from uh, what I've learned along those ways to, uh, to help you out with your reporting. So if you are a pen tester, then your report is your product. Uh, a lot of pen testers and a lot of people, I think, they think the pen test is their product. And it's part of the product, but it's it's not the thing that people pay you for. Um, to be doing a pen test is not something anybody ever wants to hire you to do. They want, because if you don't give them the report, then then there's no benefit, right? The, they You get hired as a pen tester to do a pen test, yes, but also to tell whoever hired you about what you found. And normally we do that with a report. And the, the report is, is not a side effect. Some people think, you know, well, I, I'll do the reporting later. I'll take my notes as I go, and then I'll do the report at the end, and, and I'll produce, you know, some artifacts of my testing, which will be, you know, this output from the scanners and those types of things. And also, the report is an artifact of my testing. It is not. It is not a side effect. It is the primary thing that you're doing when you're testing for pay. Um, it's a little different if you're just having a good time, if you're doing CTFs or things like that, it's obviously different there. But if you're doing this as a profession, the report is the thing that you're producing. They're not paying you to play and have a good time. Nobody, there is nobody on earth who gets paid to play. All these people on this slide here, you think of them as players. They play sports, they play music, uh, they, play, they, they play roles, they're actors, they're comedians. But even they're not getting paid to play they're getting paid for what they, what they bring in. They're paying for the result. Either they're winning games, or they're entertaining while they lose games, or they're, they're producing music that people want to purchase, or they're making people laugh. It's, it's the side effect of that that's, that's what they're getting paid for. Um, I said side effect. When, with actual performers, it's kind of a side effect, I think. But the ones who are good at it recognize that the side effect, they're having a good time, the side effect of that is the actual value that they're producing. There's nobody who gets paid literally to play. Except kids, right? Kids, they don't really get paid, but that's how they make their living, right? They get free room and board and their parents encourage them to go out and play. Um, yes, when you are a child and you're learning something, you should play. And, and it's good that kids get that time, right? Anyway, but I'm not talking about kids on the beach. I'm talking about you as a pen tester. The, whatever hacking you do during the test is, is interesting and cool for that time, but most of those things are going to get fixed at some point. If you're exploiting some vulnerable software, that, that thing's going to get fixed, and that exploit isn't going to work forever. Uh, if you find something that's misconfigured and that allows you access to something you shouldn't have access to, they're going to fix that, and you won't be able to do that forever. But the report that you write, that's, that's what lives on beyond the test. That's what people are going to go back to uh, to look at to see what happened during this test, whether it's the immediate aftermath and they're looking for things to, um, to make corrections, things to fix, or down the road and they want to see, you know, did we have a thorough pen test? Did we see this vulnerability before? The uh, pen test reports live forever. Um, one of the funniest things I've seen as a pen tester is, uh, is previous pen test reports. Like you get into the internal environment and you're looking around and shared folders for interesting documents. And, and whenever you can find the, um, the folder that has their previous ten pen test reports in it, that's, um, that's pretty funny. Anyhow, these reports live on for a long, long time. And some people, that's all they're going to see about your reports. The people who make decisions about, about what you found on your test, 
they're going to look at the report. They're not going to call you. Um, you don't want them to call you. You want them to be able to look at that report and have that stand on its own. Because if they have to call you, then you have to remember what happened. You have to dig out the report yourself. You have to go through um, some, some refreshing of your memory, what actually happened during that time. And it's way better if you can explain it clearly in the report so that the report stands on its own and you don't have to be involved uh, much beyond delivering the report. So for these reasons, I think that the report matters more than your hacking skills matter. And you need the hacking skills, obviously. But uh, I personally would rather have somebody who can hack pretty well, but write really well, versus the other way around. Um, a, a hacker who's awesome and just, just you know, pops things left and right and does these cool new attacks that maybe I never saw before, that's interesting. But if that person can't explain them to me, as a person who's hiring somebody to do that test, I don't care. I don't care that you're really cool and, and, and you've got new exploits and you can pull off things other people can't pull off if you can't explain it to me in a way that makes it valuable information for me as somebody who's running an environment or developing an application and wants it to be more secure. So when you're doing uh, pen tests, you're telling a story. You're, you're telling the story of what you see in the environment. Um, you, you don't want to tell, you don't want to try to show how awesome you are. You don't want to, John Strand says, you don't want to try to impress the wizards. Wizards trying to impress other wizards is, is no fun. It's a, it's a losing game for everybody, really. Um, you, you don't need to do that. You don't need to try to impress other people who are hackers. You need to, you need to describe what you found. Uh, it feels like you need to impress other people, but really, really you don't. And I think that feeling of needing to impress other people is where imposter syndrome comes from. Uh, years ago, imposter syndrome was something, you know, a few people found, a few people would talk about, but now it's like, it's everywhere. Everybody talks about having imposter syndrome and we all do. Everybody feels like, you know, I'm, I'm not the best person at this job. And maybe, maybe you're not. I mean, if there is a best person, that's only one person and the rest of us aren't as good as that person. But honestly, there isn't a single best person at a job. People have different skills. They have a different set of skills. And that's where you sometimes start to feel like you're inadequate is if you see somebody else who's doing something awesome that you don't know how to do. Um, don't forget there's something awesome you know how to do too. And maybe that person doesn't know it. But whether that person knows or not doesn't matter. You're, you're doing the work, right? As long as you're doing the work, you're not an imposter, right? You don't have to be the best in order to be somebody who does that job. Only one person can be the best if you even have a good definition for that. And I think it's no syndrome to recognize your limits, that you have, you, you know certain things and there's other things that you don't know. And when you recognize that, that means that that you're self-aware and that's good. It doesn't mean that you're an imposter and it doesn't mean you're suffering from a syndrome. I know how it feels. I know it feels that way. I feel the same way sometimes, but it's not true. It doesn't have to be true. When you're doing the testing, think about yourself. When you come up against a wall, think about yourself as somebody that you care about and as somebody that you want to see succeed, right? Because hopefully you do want to see yourself succeed and you do care about yourself. So be kind. Um, be, be pat yourself on the back when you find something cool and don't sweat it too much when you miss something or when somebody else finds something that maybe you wouldn't have found. Anyhow, back to the story, the story, the report, what are you doing when you do the pen test? Um, uh, the story is what's interesting to you in the environment that you're testing. It's, it's, it's maybe a sequence of events. It's the ups and the downs. It's things that work, some things that didn't work. It's alerts that you triggered. It's techniques you tried that got blocked. Um, I like this, <laughs> this, um, this methodology flow chart here. Um, it's, it, it's fun sometimes to just Google for pen testing methodology and look at the variety, the vast variety of different things that people say, here's a pen testing methodology. My favorites are the ones that are linear like this. Like you start with gathering information and then you do your analysis and planning. And once you're done with that, you do the vulnerability identification. And after that, you do the exploitation. And then you do the risk analysis after you've done the exploitation. And then at the end, you do the reporting. A, don't wait till the end to do the reporting. And B, you're going to flop around from those things. You're going to start in one place. You're going to move around. It's never linear. Um, anyway, it's just fun. So, so a good pen test 
is one where you, what is a good pen test to you? It, it's one where you came in and you, you got what you came in for. You get all the flags, you get, you get domain admin, you get free reigning environments. Maybe you got the source code for the application that you're trying to test. You got remote execution. You got, so you got in there, you just got all the stuff and that's so much fun and it feels so great. And that's, that's a good pen test. Um, a, a great pen test though, is one I think where you do all those same things and you get nowhere. You don't get privilege escalation. You don't get the source code for the application. You you don't, maybe you get like, like cross-site request, cross -site request forgery. You get something like small and, and that's all you get. But you have tried all those other things. And that's, that's great. That's great for the, the customer because you've just given them this huge list of attacks that aren't gonna work in their environment. And that's great. Um, there's, there's no winning for the tester. If you do a great job and get all the stuff, that's cool, but that's not winning. If you do a great job and don't get anything, that's not losing. And for the customer, it's the same thing. There's no passing a pen test. There's no failing a pen test. Um, there's, it's just information. It's just information. So you want to write down in your report what's interesting about the environment, good and bad. And, and that's, that's your report. That's what you're in there to do. When you're telling the story, remember that you have two audiences, at least, um, usually two. Uh, you, have, you have the story of the, the, the te that the technical people want to hear, and you have the story that the business people want to hear. So the technical people, uh, I imagine them as myself, as somebody who has the same interests and roughly the same skills that I have. Um, this is maybe somebody who knows a particular technology way better than I do, but there's other stuff that I know that maybe they don't know. So I try to imagine this person as myself a couple of years ago. And when I'm writing down um, the things for my report, I'm writing it in language and terms and with illustrations that would have been helpful to me about two years ago or whenever I was new at this stuff. And I want to make sure that that technical person can follow along in my footsteps. And that is to say that they can actually recreate the things that I did because I gave them enough information for it. So that's useful for them because then they can, they can double check and make sure that I saw what I thought I saw. And then also, once they fixed it, they can follow the same steps again and see if the fix actually worked. So it's good for them that way. The, the business people, sometimes we forget about them. And sometimes we, um, we don't give them the credit, I think, that they deserve. Uh, these are the people who own the environment, but they don't live in the environment. These are the people who, who use computers only for what they can get out of the computer and not because using the computer is fun. Uh, and it's easy sometimes to think, well, you know, they don't understand. They don't get how the computers work. Um, it's not that. It's just that that's not their focus. They're, they're smart people. I mean, you don't get to be um, executive people who are running organizations and not be some level of smart. So, so you, have to, you have to still treat them as smart people just in a different domain than than the domain that you're in. And the thing to focus on for the executives, I think, is to focus on which levers to pull in their environment. So is this a, is this a, a, a patching and updating problem that we've got here? Is this an inventory problem we've got here? Is this a staffing for incident response problem we've got here? Those are the kind of things that they wanna know. They don't care about your cool command line hacks. They wanna know what is the cause of the problem and you know, which of my managers can I assign this to to get it fixed. So one real quick story, just to show you the difference of how you would present the same information to those two different audiences. Uh, say you got um, hashes stolen from a domain controller, you got them offline, you cracked 85% of them. So the technical audience wants to know, how did you get those hashes? Where, where did you get them from? Which system? How did you get local admin rights on that system? How did you get those out of my environments? What were all the things you did that I could have seen that I missed in order to, um, to achieve that result? show the commands so that that person can recreate those things. For the business audience, don't mention ntds.dit. Don't, don't mention um, password hashes as such. Tell them what you did. What did you do? You were able to get encrypted passwords for the entire environment. You were able to pull them out of the environment. You were able to crack 85% of them. And this shows that your password policy allows people to choose weak passwords. And that's the lever they can pull. They can pull the password policy lever. Uh, they could maybe pull some monitoring levers through that. Uh, those both tell the same story, but in a different way for a different audience. 
This, is, this was an actual comment I got during tech review from one of the reports I did at work. And this is what I'm always going for. I, it was a test, there was, it, was, it was a disaster for the customer. There, there were so many problems and just really kind of basic fundamental things that they weren't doing correctly uh, or safely or securely or whatever you mean by correct, right? Um, but this, the, this told me, this feedback from internally told me that I did a good job explaining it without being condescending and without beating them up too much. I gave them a clear and accurate story that they were able then to receive and read and act on. That's what I'm always going for in my pen tests. So there is, it's hard to talk about security, right? Because everything is a secret. You're not allowed to talk to the public about problems you found in a pen test that you did for a customer because that would be bad. Uh, it's, it's good that it is that way, but it makes it hard for us to have conversations about real things. We end up making stuff up and doing proofs of concept on test systems, and those are great as far as they go, but they're not ever the whole story. So Julio here, has created a, a, a repository of public pen test reports that's fantastic. Um, it's, it's got so many of them in there now. It's a big, big repository, and it gives you a chance to see what other people are doing when they write reports. Some of these are real reports that were meant to be public for um, public uh, audits and things like that. Some of them are sample reports that have been like redacted on intentionally or done up against a test environment so that the, the person writing the report could showcase their reporting abilities. I'm not sure where they all came from, but that's where a lot of them, a lot of them come from there. So I'm using some reports from this in this talk, and I suggest that you go take a look at this yourself and and see see what's there. Just look for look for good examples, look for bad examples. It's a wonderful resource. So when you're writing, why are you writing? You're writing to inform the reader, right? You're writing so that we can communicate information to them, right? So here is one sample from one of the reports that's in this repository. This is, don't focus too much on the words, but this tells you what happened, what they found. They found a weak password policy. They show you where they found it. There's source code files and line numbers, and they tell you the impact. Why does it matter? This is a whole story. What I found, where I found it, why it matters. Going down a little bit more on this, they, um, there's, they make a claim. They say when the, um, when the user goes to change their password, it applies a six character minimum. So, and then they show you the source code where that happens. So here's my claim, here's some evidence to support that claim. Here's some discussion about why I think that claim is important. And now you can disagree. You could, as the receiver of this report, you can say that doesn't matter in my environment. And that's fine, that's your, that's your job <laughs> with the report is to balance different uh, requirements, security requirements, uh, usability requirements, all that stuff. Um, but this report has told you the facts that they found, and it has interpreted them from the point of view of a pen tester. And now you have some facts and some data that you can act on. Here's another one from a Cure53 report. They did looked at CryptoCat, and they talk about uh, math.random. They say math.random is not considered predictable, or is not considered unpredictable. Um, so. I'm starting to ask some questions. So who says? What do you mean not considered unpredictable? What makes it not unpredictable? Why is that bad? Um, it's a little less factual, but it still, it still makes an argument. It still says it makes this claim and it gives you some information to try to back that claim up. So this is still, this is still good. A little less strong, but it's still good. Another one here, we have um, uh, ProCheckup did an anonymized report. And there's a bunch going on here that, that I want you to notice in this screenshot. There's a lot of information here that's not immediately obvious. And the, the only thing I did to this was I added the arrows. Uh, it would have been cool, it would have been better, I think, if the original report had some arrows or something similar to focus your attention. But look at all that's packed into this brief little thing here. Uh, on connecting the test equipment to the network, that means they brought their own equipment, right? They're not using something that's already on the network. A DHCP service was available to gain IP addresses. Okay, so they plugged something into the network and they got an IP address and now they could communicate on that network. That's useful information right there. Maybe this network is fine for that. Maybe, it's, maybe that's not a problem, but maybe it is a network where they only, you only wanna have authorized known devices on it. So right there is something interesting to the reader. And then in this screenshot, a couple things about this. First, it's a screenshot as text, which is great if your information is text, because now you can copy and paste, right? And it wraps better around page breaks rather than using an image. What do we have here? We've got the username and the host name. Uh, we've got the hash at the prompt, which means what? It means your root. 
uh, and we run if config for f0, and we find out that we have an, uh, uh, we have an uh, IPv4 address, and we know what network we're on. The hardware address there has been redacted, but if it was not, then uh, the reader of this report, if they had a good inventory, might be able to tell for sure if this was one of their systems or not. Now, they already said it's not, but MAC address is an identifier. Hardware address is an identifier, and that's interesting. And the last part here down at the bottom is the receive bytes and the transmit bytes. That this, this is interesting, and is, it's not cut off. It's interesting because it tells you it's an active interface. Uh, that's not critical, right? It's, we're gonna, it's, it's safe to assume that you you're probably using this interface if that's how you started your testing. But having it there with some data going back and forth, not a ton, it does show that it's actually active on that interface, which is interesting, makes it a little bit better, a little more readable, a little more factual about what the test was doing. Aside from informing the readers, uh, you can use writing to insult the reader. And that's something I recommend against in your pen test reports. So here's one, uh, a company called Mnemonic uh, did an audit of the Norwegian voting systems source code. And they have this caption here. It says the example code was flagged by find security bugs plugin. And then it says, why is a crypto class using an insecure random generator? That's, that's not, don't ask questions in your report, make statements in the report. I think what they're saying is that uh, an insecure random number generator is not an appropriate thing to use for something that needs to be cryptographically secure. And that would be a better way to say it. Uh, I mean, the answer to this question is either we didn't know better or we did know better and we chose this for some other reason. Or, I mean, there's not like a, it's not a constructive thing to do. It's, it's very accusing. Uh, later on here, it says, you know, interestingly, the method using an insecure instance initialized with the time as the seed. This seems dubious. It means that the VCS might try to guess the seed to predict. It's just, it doesn't come off well. It comes off as a little bit condescending, I think. Uh, other things you can do with your writing accidentally is you can disorient the reader. It's easy to make a mistake. It's easy to make this mistake if you're, especially if you're not writing as you go. Uh, it's easy to lose track of what was happening um, during your test and not explain it in a way that's easy to follow. So here's a report from security uh, with the PDO uh, Bitcoin exchange. This is a, a short report and I want to be clear that I'm not picking on this tester. Um, I think this tester did a great job on the uh, on the test. I think the report just didn't maybe didn't get enough attention. Maybe it was, um, I don't know. He did a lot of good work, I think. And there are things that could be improved on the report is the point I'm trying to make here. Uh, this is page one of the report. There's no introduction. There's no context, no context for what we were testing here. Uh, there's, there's some code here right away. There's, uh, it talks about the OmniAuth gem that's vulnerable to state fixation. Well, what is that? Is that something that's part of the, the PDO? Did they write that? Is that a third party library? Uh, I don't know what that is. And then there's an image tag down here, image source equals yunbi.com slash auth slash Weibo. What, what is that? I don't understand. It's not obvious to me what that image tag is there for. And then it says after that, the attacker can log into the victim's account. Um, how? How do they log into the victim's account? I, I'm, not, I'm not clear on what's going on. Page six of a seven page report, it says, is a summary. It says, using the first two tricks, we're able to hijack the account. Don't, don't call them tricks. Um, maybe say what they were exactly, using this vulnerability and that vulnerability. Then using the 2FA vulnerabilities, we can do the following. We can, we can, we can create an SMS 2FA using a breach in this controller. Uh, we can brute force. If they're both activated, we can brute force this, or we can predict the one-time one -time password which means we can steal the coins from any exchange user. Feels like that's kind of hidden, right? Steal the coins from any exchange user. That's like the whole point of the exchange is to keep those secure, right? That's a big, big deal if you can steal the thing that this service is meant to protect. Um, it kind of it kind of gets buried. And then at the end, it says, it says, overall, it's a very secure exchange and the code quality is high, especially because basically everybody else sucks. 
<laughs> it, this doesn't follow, right? I'm, I'm confused because on the last page you said I can, using these simple vulnerabilities, I can steal everybody's coins. And now you're saying it's really actually pretty good. I, I don't understand how those two things jive together. So I think if the tester had taken more time to, to reread this report and maybe think about how to present the issues, I think it could be more clear. But after I read this report, I have a lot of questions. What you want to do, what you actually want to do in your reports is you want to help the reader understand what you saw when you were testing so that they can make decisions. You want to help them understand their environment that you saw as a pen tester. You want to help them understand the technical nature of the problems you found in that environment. You want them to understand the processes and the structures and the policies and the behaviors that all led to the situations that you were able to exploit. And you want to tell them all the things they're doing well, all the things that you tried that didn't work. Summarize those somehow. Is, do they have, uh, do they have a, a great incident response staff and they kept catching you at every turn? That's great. Tell them that. Do they have a really strong password policy and, and it makes password guessing or password sprays really less likely to succeed? That's great. Tell them that too. That's all the story. The, the screenshots in your report are there to illustrate the story. They're, they're there to make it more clear. They're not decorations. They don't make the story prettier. They make the story better. So here's uh, a web app I like to use to illustrate this. Here's a screenshot of a web app that has maybe a security vulnerability in it. And maybe this is a screenshot that would appear in a report that illustrates um, this vulnerability. Do you see what the problem is? Do you see what it is now? Maybe. How about now? Now it says that you're not securely connected to this site. Okay, what, is, what does that mean, not securely connected to this site? Um, now, you know probably that it means it's not encrypted, but security is not encryption. There are other ways your connection could be insecure. You could be routing through an insecure network. You could be on a coffee shop network. Uh, there's lots of things that could be, mean insecure, um, and it's not just encrypted. So these, these used to be better. Um, a, a while ago, the <laughs> Firefox and Chrome and everybody had an address bar. And in the address bar, they showed the address of what you were visiting. And now they don't do that anymore. They're, they're taking that stuff away. They're taking away the details to make it um, more user friendly, I think is what they say, but it's hiding information that's useful. And now um, actual addresses that used to be in the, in the address bar are getting chased away. Important parts are getting hidden. So here, what's being hidden is the whole protocol. Uh, you don't know how it's connecting. You know the address, but you don't know how it's getting there. And uh, you, can, you can fix your browser. You can make it tell you um, the addresses. Uh, in, in, in Firefox, it's uh, browser.urlbar.trim URLs. Tell it, don't do that. Um, because honestly, if you have a URL without a protocol at the beginning, it's not a URL anymore. Anyhow, so fix your browser, and this is a better screenshot. This tells you you're not securely connected. It circles the HTTP part, which is what it means here by not secure, and it links those two together. So this is what I have in my report. We started with this, the whole thing, and we came back down to this. Very focused, very clear. You can't misunderstand this one. Now, as I said before, you can disagree all you want. You can say that for this site, HTTPS doesn't matter, or we use HTTP on purpose for these other reasons. And awesome, that's great. It's not my application. It's not my choice to say you must have encryption. It's, uh, it's just an observation, and it's clear. And if we, can dis if we disagree about it, now we're disagreeing about something specific. There's two things every screenshot wants to have. Every screenshot should be helpful and it should be clear. Uh, helpful means that it's relevant and it adds useful information and it's accurate. Clear means that it's legible, it directs your attention, and it's precise. So helpful and accurate, I'm using as synonyms here, and clear and precise as well. So if you come, I come from an arts background, I like helpful and clear. If you come from a math background or a science background, maybe accurate and precise are better words for you. So accurate means it should be correct. It should, it should be show what you mean to show. And precise means it shouldn't show much else. It should be focused narrowly in on what you want to illustrate. So as you're taking a screenshot, here are some decisions to make. Do you want the whole browser window or do you want just cropped to just an important part? 
uh, generally, if you have the whole Chrome of the browser, if you have the address bar and the scroll bars and everything, rethink it because those aren't helpful usually. Do you want a plain screenshot because the issue is just self-evident there? Or do you need something to direct people's attention with boxes and arrows or things like that? How about the text in the screenshot? Is that readable? Is it, has the, the image been shrunk down so much that it's too pixelated and you can't read the words? Or on the other hand, is it so big that the words on the screenshot are like bigger than the titles in the text around it? You want the text that's important in there to be about the same size as the text that's around it. Uh, and then do you have just the viewport or do you include the URL as well? And I think you should always include the URL if you can have it in the address bar and it's readable and that fits with the size and scale of what you want to report. That's great. If you can't do that, then just make sure the URL is somewhere in text near the, uh, near the screenshot so that it's, it, it's not just floating out there. There's a screenshot somewhere. I don't know how to get there. You want to make sure that your reader knows how to get to the thing that you're showing. Your screenshot should be composed with a little bit of thought. So I said before, you don't want to have the browser Chrome and everything. Uh, this is three different screenshots of the same issue. So on the, on the left, we've got that you know, thoughtless kind of thing. It's just here's the whole page, and this is the issue, and here you go. And it's hard to read. The text is small. There's a bunch of stuff in there we don't need. It's unfocused. It's not awesome. The, the top right is better. It's pulled out just the important part. Uh, but it's a little bit awkward. The composition makes it such that the text is a little bit too small to read. There's a bunch of uh, white space or pale blue space in the top right there that's not helpful. If we just shrink the window a little bit, this application flows so things start to wrap differently. So the bottom right there, I've shrunk it small enough that, that it, um, when it's full size in the, in the report, you can read all the words. There's not a lot of extra white space. Now you can read the site URL. You can tell the IP address that it was. You can see the time that this was done and you can see, you can read all those little um, red and green guys that tell you where the problem was. You wanna have thoughtful contrast and there's some controversy over this one and I don't understand why there's controversy over this one. Uh, dark mode, right? People like the dark mode and that's fine. You can like dark mode all you want and you can use it all you want. But in a report, you're not the audience. Uh, it's not for you. It doesn't need to look nice to you. And also, if you're doing reports as uh, Word documents or as any a PDF or anything, the background is going to be white. Uh, it's going to be white. And this huge contrast here, this is the same screenshot in, uh, in Burp Suite's uh, dark mode versus regular, not dark mode. <laughs> And the one on the right is just, it's a little shocking. It's a little bit, there's too much contrast there. It's hard to see what's going on. And actually the burp version of uh, dark mode doesn't have very good contrast either. It's all just muddy gray for the most part. I'm not the only one who thinks this and people writing pen test reports aren't the only ones who screw it up. Um, this is a published book, printed book uh, that Mubix found where they use dark mode for screenshots. And you literally cannot read this. I have this book and I've looked at it. You, you cannot make out anything in that screenshot because it's so dark. There's no reason for it. It's not helpful. You wanna use thoughtful words. You wanna explain, like I said earlier, clearly to, you, to yourself who you were maybe two years ago. You wanna make it obvious how to reproduce the behavior that you're seeing, that you're talking about in this section of the report. Uh, include prerequisites if you have to, um, put something in your shopping cart and it's a specific thing that has this vulnerability, then say that. If you have to be on a certain part of the network in order to see the target you're going after, say that. Um, make it clear which box you were on, what system you were on when you did the attack so they can see how that went. Maybe it doesn't work from the, the person who's reading it. Maybe their system doesn't have the same access that that system had. There's a, there's a firewall or a different network, something. Uh, make that clear. And stick to the facts. Don't, don't blame yeah, don't, don't, don't call people names. Don't say, why would you do that in the report? Stick to the facts. Explain why things are the way they are to you, why they appear to you the way they do, what you think is important, and let them make their own decisions. So a couple of screenshots from these reports in uh, Julio's repo. Are these decorations or are these illustrations? Do they help or are they just taking up space? So here's uh, CryptoCat. Um, screenshot. And we've got a browser. There is no address in the address bar. 
uh, we've got the, uh, the inspector open, so we can see there's a span class, has an email address in it. Um, I, I don't know what this try, is trying to show me. Uh, I, I think, I'm guessing, that that iframe in the middle shouldn't be there because it says evil, but there's nothing here that tells me how it got there or why I should worry about it or what it means or which part of this screenshot is even the important part for me to notice. So this one's decoration. This one, I think, uh, it does tell you what application we're using, so that's useful, but the specifics of why this screenshot, why here, I'm, I'm lost. They did another one of uh, Mailvelope. And so this is showing us um, uh, Gmail years ago. And again, we've got the, um, we've got the developer tools open and we can see there's a, there's a script in there. Uh, there's a script above in the, the document's um, compose window. It says injection in progress. This is the attacker's point of view. What, what is the attacker seeing that, that I need to pay attention to? If, if this is the attacker's point of view, they've, they've got that, that text in, the, in the, uh, the text area there. Why is, the, um, why is the, the developer's tool thing open? Is that something they need to do the attack? Anyway, I, just, I don't know what this is showing me. I don't know how this is supposed to make me understand the issue better. NCC group tested PHP my admin and I picked this screenshot because there are no screenshots in it. This this uh, the screenshot of their report. They I think they have a they must have a policy because there are almost never screenshots in their reports. And so that's I I disagree. I think screenshots are super helpful and to choose not to include them I think is not great. I would disagree. But they've made a choice and they back it up pretty well. This the words that are here are just about as good as you can get without having a screenshot. So they're working within the constraints they have. They've got a policy, I'm guessing, that says no screenshots. So how do we make it clear without those? And this is a great job of doing that. Here is one more, uh, one more screenshot that is just not helpful. Uh, this one says access is granted to 10.10.10.2.10 as local administrator. And it's a screenshot of the entire desktop. And what's it trying to show? Well, with the caption above it, I think it's trying to show me that I'm logged into 10.10.10.2.10 as the local administrator. But there's nothing in that screenshot that shows me the IP address of the system I'm connected to. And the only thing that gives me any clue that I'm administrator is the title under the start menu there. It says administrator. Now that's just the username, right? I think it's possible for that to be, you can have a user who's named administrator who doesn't have admin rights. So it's not a super reliable uh, indicator. And even if it was, it's a tiny, tiny fraction of this whole screenshot. All that other stuff is completely unnecessary. So I would, I would argue that there's a better screenshot that could have been taken to illustrate that you're logged into a particular system with a particular set of privileges. And, um, and also this is just way too big. It doesn't, it doesn't do what it claims to do. And then uh, another anonymized report from ProCheckup. I love this one because, again, it's a screenshot of a terminal and it shows you the text. It's not an image. It shows you who you're logged in as. It shows you where you're SSHing to. So if you SSH to something called Spike and you don't give it a username, what's the username that you're connecting as? It's whatever your current username is, right? So it's root. And we get connected. It says last login from Mustang and it's got this banner and, and we're logged in. So it worked. So I logged into the system called Spike as root. And then just to make it extra clear, I, we typed who am I, semicolon, another command, and an ID. Because who am I gives you the username who's logged in. ID gives you the UID, which is actually what determines that you're root. Because again, you could have a user called root who doesn't have root privileges. Uh, this shows you both of those things. And they went so far as to do it on a single line so that this is a more compact screenshot. Uh, you might just type who am I, enter, and then ID, enter. And you get the same information, but it takes up more space that way. So this is a well thought out screenshot that shows you exactly what they want us to see. So in your screenshots, you want facts and clarity. You want accuracy and precision. Pay attention to how you, you create those things. This is a screenshot from one of the reports by Red Siege. They pen tested Nakatomi Plaza, if you can believe that. Uh, they show in this one, they show you the URL and it's readable. It's a good size. You can see what that is. And 
the other thing I got an arrow pointing to here, these are my arrows, not theirs. Uh, there's a log off button. So what if, what does that tell you that there's a log off button? It tells you that you're logged in. So this is a nice compact single screenshot that shows you where I am. It shows you that I'm logged in and it shows you some of the information that I can get access to from that system. Later in that report, they're showing you some uh, HTTP traffic. And, and again, they show it as text, not as an image, which is great. They've got this bold, I added the arrows again, but they've got bold, the system they're connecting to. They're using curl with these particular command line options and they're connecting to nakatomiplaza.nope. So if you're reading this report, you can do that exact same thing. You can run that command yourself right now. And then the response shows you the, the part that they want you to pay attention to. That it came back with this strict transport security header and that's what we're talking about. So if you run this command now, you'll see that same strict transport security header and now we're on the same page. Now we're seeing the same things and now we can talk about whether we think that's an issue or not. So again, maybe the last time, illustrate, don't decorate. Don't just put a screenshot because you wanna have a screenshot. Put a screenshot in because it helps, because it clarifies, it tells the story better. You wanna keep your audience in mind. Are they gonna know what to see in that screenshot or do you need to direct their attention a little bit? Uh, more screenshots is better as long as they're not just taking up space. Uh, you're probably going to need boxes and arrows in your screenshots. It is, it is a rare screenshot that stands for itself and doesn't need any explanation. They do exist, absolutely, but they're rare. If you have one without any, think for a second and make sure that you think that's the best way you can handle that. Formatting issues are another thing that a little bit of attention goes a long way. Uh, you, you don't have to make it art, um, but you can make it pretty. You can make it consistent. Uh, um, when uh, I'm, I'm, I'm kind of old, and when word processors first came out that you could do multiple fonts in, everybody's reports had 15 different fonts in them just because they could use it, and they looked horrible because they were so inconsistent. Uh, we do that now still when we format things manually. Like if you're double clicking on a word and you're saying bold, or if you're tr making a heading by making it just bigger and putting an extra carriage return after it, you're, you're doing it wrong and you're making it harder on yourself than you need it to be. Uh, Scott Hanselman has a series of videos called How to Really Use Microsoft Office that are wonderful for this. They're brief, they're to the point, uh, he's, he's easy to understand and fun to listen to. Go watch those. Uh, Take some time and just see if the way he shows you how to make these things work isn't something that you can add to your little ball of tricks. A couple quick good examples from uh, Julio's repository here to show you some things that I think work well uh, and a few that we could just tweak a little bit. So in this report, there's a screenshot of uh, terminal output and it's on a dark background and I kind of don't like that, but that's not why we're talking about this one. This one is running GPG commands. Now, raise your hand if you can just type GPG commands off the top of your head and get them right and interpret the output and understand what's going on. I don't see any hands. <laughs> so what is going on here? Uh, what's going on here is they're, they're verifying this signature on this application. And they've got, what, seven, eight lines of text, and, and that's how you're supposed to notice. The, the important part here is where it says good signature. That's, that's the key. We're checking the signature, we're checking who is the issuer of the signature key, and we're making sure that it's a good signature. So this should be circled. Something should draw your attention to the fact that there was a good signature. And then there's another command that's run. Uh, we run the dot app image uh, with dash dash app image dash signature. Um, do you know exactly what that means? Is that self-evident what's going on there? I don't think it is. I think that could be done a little better. Why did we run that second command? What are we supposed to see there? Here's another, and this is just a quick show you why it's better to do terminal output or text uh, images as text instead of as images. Because this one got broken across uh, a page boundary. The top of there is page nine, the bottom is page 10. If this had been uh, put in as an image, there'd be an inch and a half blank space at the bottom of page nine and then page 10 would start with the whole screenshot. That makes it harder to read, a little bit harder to follow. So if you have text, present it as text. 
And, and look, it's a light background with dark text, like every word processing document ever. Uh, Proton VPN Windows app. The interesting thing about this one is it's not a screenshot, but it's telling you exactly what they tested. There's a, a SHA-1 sum of these files that were part of what they tested, even of the README. So if you want to, if you're trying to fix this or you're trying to recreate these issues, you can know exactly what they were looking at and whether you're looking at the same thing or not. This is fantastic. Same application. This is some text, but it's not shown as text. But it's okay here, I think, because it's small. Uh, and it's awesome because they highlight the part that's important. Uh, they, use the, they use their hex editor itself to do the highlighting. They just selected that and it's highlighted. Nothing had to be done after the screenshot was taken to show you the important part of it. Now imagine you got the screenshot, but nothing was highlighted. What are you supposed to make of this? You might, you might know as, as a tester, as somebody who's familiar with looking at hex dumps, but not everyone's gonna know that. Your executives certainly aren't gonna be familiar with this and your newer, uh, technical folks, they might not either. They might recognize that, oh, I think that's hex, but they might not know how to interpret it. So this is a huge help to have that. So it doesn't have to be art, but you can still make it pretty. Keep thing, use formatting to keep things consistent. Use it to focus the attention to the right things um, and make the computer do it. Look at those handsome videos and he will help you see how to make Word do your work for you. A couple of things not to do. Uh, never, ever, ever copy and paste from a previous report. I don't care how small it is, uh, the risk that you accidentally include one customer's information in a report that goes to another customer is too high to, to benefit the brief time savings of copying and pasting from one report to another. So, but you say, oh, but I've seen this issue before. I don't wanna to have to write all those words again. I agree, don't. Write it up once, generically, with no customer information, and save that somewhere. And then when you see that same information, copy and paste from there. Just don't copy and paste from another report. And also, uh, tool output. Uh, don't ever just um, assume that the tool output stands on its own, either. Uh, the tools are things that can be bought. A lot of them are free. So if you're just giving me tool output, then what's the value that you're adding as a technical person? Why should I hire you again if you're just going to run tools that I could run? Um, I could pay my employees way less than I pay the consultant to do the same thing. So make sure that you're giving context and some analysis and why that's important, not just tool output. One more thing that gets overlooked is, um, is using colors. It's generally speaking a bad idea to convey information with color alone. And the reason for that is that there are, there are people who don't see colors the same way you see colors. And colors don't always translate across media. And sometimes people still print things out and look at them. And sometimes they print them out in black and white. And then there's no color. So this is, a, um, this is from one of the reports in, in that repo I showed you. And it shows you the, the risk ratings and the color they use for those risk ratings. On the left is how it appears in the report. On the right is how it would appear to somebody who, is, who has got the uh, red blind version of color blindness. And if you look at that in the key, the informational stuff and the high stuff are almost the same. They're almost identical. So it's not a great useful gradient to use red for bad and green for good. So what do you do about it? What do you, we always, red means bad and green means good, right? And that's a common thing that people use. So what do you do instead? Here's something you can do instead. Looking at the, um, the Red Siege report, they use color and symbols. To, to convey the information. So we have uh, a red circle with the exclamation point is the highest severity thing. So even when you lose the red, you still get the exclamation point. Uh, orange circle that's solid is the medium one. So you still get a solid circle and a half filled circle and an empty circle. So using something besides color to redundantly convey the same information makes it more useful in more different places. The other thing you can do is you can try to use colors that are still distinguishable, even for folks that don't see colors the same way you see them. And this is hard because there's lots, there are different kinds of color blindness and they don't all manifest the same way. So it's difficult to come up with more than two colors really that you can reliably distinguish. Uh, but here's a report that tried to do that and they, they did pretty well, I think. They, you can, those all look pretty different, except two and four look pretty similar. 
but and that that goes to the point of view something besides color. But you can you can do um, you can choose colors that are more distinguishable. The last thing I want to show you really quick, I just want to point you at some of these uh, things you can use do in Microsoft Word to make Word better for you. Uh, a lot of reports are still done in Microsoft Word. So if you don't use Word, you can skip this. But if you do, um, look into using styles to keep things consistent. Don't format words and phrases independently with bold and italic and bigger use styles. Uh, you can use autocorrect to save time. So when you type something in um, that's a misspelling that Word knows about, it fixes it for you, right? You can define your own and you can make anything expand into anything else. So I have in my Word, I have some abbreviations uh, that I put in as misspellings, and the correct spelling is a whole paragraph of text. So I type in one little thing, and poof, I get out, I get that whole paragraph all at once. Uh, you can use macros for things that aren't trying to pop a shell. <laughs> you can use macros to go through the document and check formatting and and clean things up. You can use a custom dictionary with words that you um, that. Microsoft Word would normally complain about spelling wrong uh, to see less of those. And a lot of these things get stored in a file called normal.dot or normal.dot.m. Um, and those will carry with you across every new document you create from that installation of Microsoft Word. Scott Hanselman gets into some of those things, uh, but they're worth exploring on your own. So autocorrect, macros, custom dictionary, those are things that you can Google to find how to get started with them and see if they might be useful for you. So as I said before, your report matters more than your hacking. It really, really does. Without a report, the hacking might as well not have happened as far as the people who need to fix it are concerned. So pay attention. Try to do well. Look at it as you're going and stop for a second. Look at it again and see, does that make sense to me? If I wasn't the one who wrote this, would I know why that screenshot's there and what I'm supposed to get out of it? Have I described the issue clearly and fairly and factually so that somebody with different opinions and different priorities than, than me can make an informed decision? A couple quick references, and that is it. Thank you for coming. I'm, I think I'm around for any questions.